Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. The most powerful prince you've never heard of, and he's influential in Washington. We're talking about Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, the 29-year-old commander of the almost negligible Air Force of the United Arab Emirates. Holy moly, that's a mouthful. So, for short, right, we're going to refer to Prince Mohammed bin Zayed as MBZ, which is how he is commonly referred to uh, by those in the circles that discuss him. So we're going to look at this man and why you care about what he's doing. He controls a country that has fewer citizens than Rhode Island. He's relatively unknown to the American public, but he may be the richest man in the world. He controls sovereign wealth funds worth $1.3 trillion, more than any other country. His influence operation in Washington, D.C. is legendary. His military is the Arab world's most potent, equipped through its work with the United States to conduct high-tech surveillance and combat operations far beyond its borders. And for decades, the prince has been a key American ally following Washington's lead, but now he's going his own way. He's going to do his own thing. And obviously this would concern you because of some of the statistics, hopefully, that I've shared. Uh, that's not to say that this is necessarily a bad dude. That's part of what we're going to look at is relative to the other choices in the region. Is this who we should be working with? And how have things changed from Obama to Trump and our relationship with MBZ? But we couldn't begin this critical conversation without your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. Sounds like an interesting individual. I think so. Uh, he's and the, one that carries a lot of weight and power. So, Lance, just so that people are clear, right? If you haven't heard of the UAE, the United Emir- the United Arab Emirates, uh, this is a very tiny country off the eastern side of Saudi Arabia. Okay, and it's surrounded on all sides by ocean, except for the land side, which again is its border on land is completely shared with Saudi Arabia. Um, Very small, like we highlighted before, less citizens of the UAE than of Rhode Island. Um, So not very big. But again, as we talk about why you care about this and this this particular man, uh, he's been in charge here for quite some time. And back in 1991, he convinced his father at the time to transfer $4 billion into the United States Treasury to help pay for the war in Iraq. We have a long history with the UAE and with this man. Uh, and he's a British-trained helicopter pilot. He has quite a number of um, educational – he has quite a background in education, I guess I should say. And he's well known for being humble, which is not typically something that you think about when you think about a prince. It's worth mentioning all of the data that we're discussing today or all this information comes from the New York Times Sunday, June 2nd edition. And one of the reasons that Lance and I are taking time to cover this is because as the article highlights, this is probably somebody you've either never heard of or you heard of and didn't really make note of. And we want you to understand that sometimes those are the people that you have to be the most aware of Mm -hmm. are the ones that would like to be the least known. Um, Work behind the scenes. Yeah. But very much have influence. The article explains that most Arab royals are long-winded and prone to keep visitors waiting, but not Prince Mohammed. At 18, he graduated from the British Officers Training Program at Sandhurst. He stays fit, trades tips with visitors about workout machines, and never arrives late for a meeting. American officials invariably describe him as concise, inquisitive, and even humble. He pours his own coffee, and to illustrate his love for America, sometimes tells visitors that he has taken his grandchildren to Disney World incognito. 
He makes time for low-ranking American officials and greets senior dignitaries at the airport. With a shy, lopsided smile, he will offer a tour of his country, then climb into a helicopter to fly his guest over the skyscrapers and lagoons of the capital. So, again, not typically, I think, what comes to mind when we picture anybody in royal in royalty, right? Right. Uh, whether that's in the Arab world or not, uh, they're usually – maybe not as friendly as he is. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons this alliance, and Lance, you can, again, provide any extra light here But like, light but here like you, you said, he studied, he studied in England, is very familiar with the latest weaponry, has you know been to the United States and asked for weapons to protect his oil fields, and is willing to spend money, and influential because President Trump has taken two or three of MBZ's stances of political stances in the Middle East as his own. So he carries some influence with our current president, not just presidents for the last 25 years, but currently um, he has the ear of our president and the trust um, to believe and follow some of the things that he would like to see done in his region. So all of those things make him a very important figure. He tends to emphasize, too, that the United Arab Emirates uh, is more liberal than many of its neighbors. For example, women have more opportunities. A third of cabinet ministers are female. And unlike Saudi Arabia, the UAE allows Christian churches and Hindu or Sheikh temples, partly to accommodate a vast foreign workforce. The country is estimated to have 9 million residents, but fewer than 1 million citizens. The rest are foreign workers. So that gives you a little bit idea of he's presiding over a country where these foreign people are very critical to the success of his country. It's also important to note that the UAE is often described as – um a collection of city-states that are in union together uh, to have this country. So lots of cities that historically have pretty much kind of been – they've governed themselves as like their own country, uh, band together to provide a stronger front as the UAE. And he's been able to keep them all together. Right. From a country that historically, I think it mentions that his father, the first leader of the country, was illiterate. And he's been able to take these tribes and these groups of people and bring them together, as you stated, and turn them into one of the richest countries in the world with their oil supply and the fact that there aren't very many of them. And then the ability, I wonder if our president could learn how do you, uh, and I don't think I really want to know because from what I've read, it's not very done very well, but they've brought in so many foreign workers to do the work that's needed in the country with everybody having so much money. Mm-hmm. And and the fact is they're not treated extremely well. But no, <laughs> they're uh, well by by American standards. Right, the foreign workers are not treated very well. But I, in so many parts of the world where there's an abundance of population and no work, women go and take care of children. Men go and and work and you know build all the th- the things that these people with money want, and then they can take care of their whole family. Not unlike. What happened in the United States with the birds of paradise, with the immigrants coming over to the United States and living for 10 or 15 years and making enough money to take care of their families and then returning back to their home countries in Italy and different places. So, you know, you see it anywhere where there is great expansion economically, where the poor from other countries come in and work and then send the money back home to take care of people. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it's been. It's done in every century. Well, and I have to correct something from before. I said that the only country it shares a a land border with is Saudi Arabia. That's not actually true. That's its major border. It also shares a border with, I believe it's Oman. Oman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a country that we don't I, – I don't know if we've ever actually spoken about them directly. Um, just to give people context here, you've got Saudi Arabia – if we're looking at that as kind of the middle of the map, um, a, ra- a little more than 500 miles across Saudi Arabia. Below that, um, right below them, you've got Yemen and um, Oman to the east of Yemen. And then the United Arab Emirates sits uh, kind of tucked in uh, n- to the east of Saudi Arabia and to the north of 
Oman. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's bordered, the rest of its border is all water. Right across the water is Iran. So this gives you an idea of it's in a very um, <laughs> uh, uh, conflict. Strategic location. Yes. Uh, a, a very strategic location, and it's in a part of the world where conflict is not uncommon. So part of what we want to highlight is, again, we're not saying he's a great dude, but we are saying that there, he's worth noting that he's been able to hold his little country together, especially with the vast amount of foreign workers you have. Now, granted, as Lance said, they're not treated terribly well, um, but this is all relative to other countries in the area. By our standards, the way they treat women may not be acceptable, but the fact that a third of cabinet ministers are women is practically uh, unheard of in the Middle East. That is very unusual. Well, it's, there's not a third in our president's cabinet. Right. Or in our Congress. Mm -hmm. There's not a third of, I don't think the Senate, I know there's not a third in the Senate, and I don't think there's a third right. that in are the women. House that are women. So yeah. those are greater numbers than what we can boast. It's easy to look at those and say, you know, that they don't sound like very good statistics. But I think when Lance puts them in context like that, it helps us realize, no, they're they're pretty progressive for the part of the world they're in. Now, this is all in the context of, okay, Prince Mohammed seemed to find a kindred spirit back when President Barack Obama took office in 2009. Um, the article describes them as both being somewhat detached analytic, and intrigued by big questions. For a time, Mr. Obama sought phone call, phone conversations with Prince Mohammed more than with any other foreign leader, according to several senior White House officials. And the interesting thing is how this relationship changed uh, as a result of the Iran nuclear deal. This was mostly brokered behind closed doors in secret uh, between the Obama administration and Iran. And the way that the public sees this and the way that this author shares with us um, th what the problem was is that after having been an insider for so long in Washington and somebody that we relied on in the area uh, to help meet our goals, the fact that we didn't include them in the process uh, was something that Prince Mohammed ultimately took offense to. So kind of in the back half of Obama's administration, that relationship had started to sour some, and it looks like things might have been mended shortly before Obama was set to leave office when Prince Mohammed was scheduled to come for a dinner as friends with Obama prior to him leaving office, but instead canceled that trip rather abruptly without much explanation and instead flew to New York to meet the president-elect. Mm -hmm. uh, so... This now moves us into today where – Well, but think about it. <clears throat> you feel like you've been kind of pushed aside and that person's on their way out mm -hmm. and you want to be a major player and you want people to – do you want to have influence and you like having influence and you want to save face. You go to the new person because even if the old person is going to thank you for what they've done, they're no longer of any use to you. Whereas – and you left on you know the last – thing you did, you kind of felt like you were pushed aside. So why not go to the new leader and see what you can get and see if you can establish something so that you can be a major player in foreign affairs in the Middle East again? I mean, it makes sense that he would do that. I mean, why not? Right. If, if you're him, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like, well, the United States didn't want me when they made, when they signed their treaty, you know, their nuclear treaty with Iran. So I'm going to go to the new guy, and let's see what kind of relationship I can get there because that's the person that's going to be in power in this country for the next four years. So, I mean, it's a it's a logical ploy. It's a logical play and um, makes sense when you're somebody who wants to continue to have power and have a say. Yep. Well, that's what you, I mean. You, he has to start thinking about the next leader. Now, the relationship has improved some since then, but the key here is the relationship. The thing that's become a little bit concerning to some in Washington is that the prince now seems to be somewhat pursuing his own interests and sometimes in contrast to our interests. Uh, now, it would be easy, I think, if Obama was still president to chalk that up to the Iran situation. But the question is, Lance, why? Why now, right? You've got this positive 
I mean, seemingly positive. We don't know that it actually is, I suppose. But at a public surface level, it seems to at least be a positive rapport with our president. Uh, but they're kind of doing their own things. Did we give them too much lease? We've sold them a lot of military weaponry and equipment um, over the years. You know, we've relied on them for a lot of things. And maybe now they've decided that they don't need us as much as they did. Oh, I, <clears throat> I think most definitely. <clears throat> Excuse me, but you look at – and you look at President Trump, if you say good things about him, then you're his buddy forever and he trusts you until you say negative things about him. I mean, we, we've got, you know, the North Korean leader testing missiles and Trump still saying, yeah, well, he's one of my best friends because he's, you know, he said everything to President Trump that President Trump likes to hear. And I think, you know, NBC saw that and has is continuing to do that and now feels like, well, as long as I keep paying the president compliments and as the president says, hey, we don't care. We're making money selling to people, you know, and he's a friend of ours, so we'll sell it to him and we'll make money. And, you know, we're making money off of selling all of this military hardware to him and their money's as good as everybody else's. I don't think the president then really cares what's going to happen. The president is more reactionary than, I mean, he has been for, Two and a half years of his presidency, as far as foreign policy is concerned, you know, he's totally reactionary and and sticks to his guns and does what he wants. I mean, this isn't a show on the tariff issue, but, you know, he's told Mexico, you better stop people from come, coming over the border. And he just, you know, said, I'm going to increase the tariff five more percent, you know, no matter what it's going to do to the economy or long range. You know, this president does what they want to do, and especially if you're somebody who either is buying stuff from his country you know, from the United States, or if you're patting him on the back and giving him plaudits, you can pretty much do whatever you want as long as you don't make him look bad. Do you think that part of the UAE now doing more of what it wants is that it perceives America to maybe not care as much about what it's doing when it when it doesn't clearly directly pertain to us? Oh, exactly. I mean, is that it's 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 open season out there. I mean, we we've become that's part of being nationalist, right? That you only care about you and you don't realize the broad base of what's going on in foreign countries and how that can affect you until it's too late. I mean, to me, that's the whole setup of what we've been talking about with President Trump for the last two and a half years. You know, everything looks good. I mean, everything we're doing is going to be good for the United States in the short term. But what's it going to do to destabilize the world in the long term? And what's it mean we're going to have to do later on, long after he's done being president? And how many people will connect these things to this presidency? I mean, only history, you know, will write that story. You know, all the things that we have, all the different places we're going to have to go and maybe put out fires or get drawn into conflicts or hurt the economy down the road long after President Trump is done and gone. You know, these things can all help in the short term. But what I, at least I've been saying is that in the long term, this probably isn't good for the United States if we want to continue being, um, a world power, which I don't, I'm not sure that President Trump, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if, you know, he wants his definition of world power and my, I'll just say this, my definition of world power and his definition of world power are probably different. Mm -hmm. We probably differ. Yeah. Well, there, and, and there are different ways. Obviously, to to view how we proceed with foreign policy, I think the the danger here is with our current approach to foreign policy, and this is what we'll talk a little bit in the back half of the show. I think we've been taking this approach. I don't know, Lance. You tell me more. The historian for probably since Hawaii was last added as a state. Okay, um, maybe ten or twenty years after that's when things started to shift. Where our push has not so much been. Um, official control of anything. You know, it's been more in influence control, right? Mm -hmm. Nation building and at least the illusion that these nations are free and independent countries. Uh, well, so I think you go back to the end of World War II and the Marshall Plan and rebuilding the world and the fact that we really, you know, our, our infrastructure was not mm -hmm. attacked. I mean, Hawaii was, but not the mainland right. United States and everybody else. The cities were destroyed, whether you were, mm -hmm. you know, the allied forces or, you know, you were, you were the Axis powers. It didn't, it didn't really matter that all of the infrastructure was destroyed. And so the world could look to us and we could provide so much. And we had, 
we were coming out of an economic depression and had troops. And so it was like, yeah, we're, we're going to build nations and going and going into the cold war. We're going to give everybody everything they want so that they'll be good to us. And so that we'll have more allies and we don't really want to run you, but your economy is going to be connected to ours, which then makes us allies militarily as well. And so there's no reason for us to take over. Right. There's no reason for us to run you as long as you do the things that we want you to do. And in return, we get the raw materials or the military allies or the naval bases or the Air Force bases that we need to stop the spread of communism around the world. And then, and then it's continued to be that way to produce these safe areas out there so that we fight these smaller conflicts other places so that it doesn't come to affect the mainstream of the United States. You know, we haven't had that no. many peaceful days in the United States since World War II. No. But we haven't, the the home of the United States has not been threatened. One of our geographic advantages. Right. I mean, historically well, speaking. It's a geographic it's a advantage harder. and also putting military bases around the world and selling steel and refrigerators mm -hmm. and cars and food and everything else that people wanted to these countries so that they will allow us or protect us because some of these places have been attacked over the years because they've been friendly to the United States. Mm -hmm. But we say, Hey, do you want to keep being friendly to us? You know, here's another 5,000 refrigerators, right? Here's another 2 million bushels of corn. Or a new base to or, keep you safe. Sure, right. I mean, whatever it is, right? Whatever it is you want so that you can stay in power with your people so they don't overthrow you, we will give you or sell you at a good price or whatever so that you can stay in power if you stay loyal to us. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to look at what the potential downside of that approach may be and how it relates back to this situation with the United Arab Emirates. But before we do, Lance, we got to tell people what we're doing here. What are we doing here today? Hmm? What's um, our goal? I'm trying to stay awake. It's been a okay. long night, but yeah. uh, you got up early. Oh, didn't go to bed. Oh, okay. Yeah. I had, gotcha. had to have somebody, had to have somebody at the airport at four o'clock this morning. So mm. it's about an hour away. So that tells you I was on the road <laughs> at three. So up at two. So kind of just, yeah. Lots of fun. Lots of good stuff. But what a true chat, what we're always <laughs> trying to do is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. Whether we're tired or awake or we're clicking on all cylinders or on one, <laughs> we are always trying to have that great conversation to educate you, our loyal listening audience. We've got a super important, honest conversation that we're about to have. It won't be very long, uh, but we we last mentioned the debate of the day in the episode that we did prior to this, and we talked about waffles or pancakes. If you could only have one, which is it? Now, the in-studio decision between our producer, Caleb, Lance, and myself uh, was unanimously waffles, uh, but I know that there were a few people who were not terribly thrilled uh, with our conclusion there. And, uh, I think they contended that you're just not making pancakes the right way if you don't, <laughs> if you don't like them better than waffles. So maybe there's something to that. You'll have to send us some pancakes. Well, I, I never said I didn't like pancakes. I just, right. I, I had to choose one or the other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, Lance, breakfast food and I were good friends. Okay. There's not, there's not much I've meant in the way of breakfast food that I will not gladly eat if it's available. Fair enough. So, uh, but today we turn away from food for a moment. And this is one thought up by our producer. So if you hate it, if you hate it, then, uh, we know who to blame. But cause, cause mine, Lance, was going to be cake or pie. But we'll save that for a different day. So gotcha. the, the, what you need to be thinking about here, audience, is would you <clears throat> rather make $250,000 a year, quarter of a million dollars, and hate your job or make $20,000 a year but love your job. I modified it slightly from what our producer suggested. Well, you can't make 20000 because you can't stay alive. Uh, depends that's on where you live. That's the poverty level. 30000 that's, that's not Did fair. You say 30000 Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's too many. You can live on $30,000 a year. Oh, maybe out in the middle of nowhere. Maybe. Maybe. You couldn't in Cincinnati. Well, it depends on where you live in Cincinnati. You might you might not like where you live. Fine, fine. We'll stick with the original. Would you rather make two hundred fifty thousand a year and hate your job, or make forty thousand a year but love your job? Let us know. You have to think about it right now. Come up with your answer, 
And you'll find out our answer when we come back. Welcome back. So, very important, Lance. Would you rather make 250000 a year and hate your job or make 40000 a year but love your job? I don't like the question, but um, <laughs> because I don't think it's a fair, fair numbers to actually evaluate. But I will stay true to my inner self, and that is I would – Having worked somewhere for 20, for 30 years and 29 of it not considering it a job and one year considering it was a job, I would much rather work somewhere where I enjoyed where I was working, no matter the money I was making. Because I know I was making the most money I ever made my last year I was employed and it was my most miserable year of my life. So I'll have to, I mean, to be true to that, I would have to say that I would rather make less money and like my job, getting up and going to work every day yep. rather than, than the counter. Because it's just, I, I just, 29 years, I love my job. And one year I couldn't stand it. And I, that's why I retired. And it didn't matter that you were making. It didn't matter that I was making good money. Yep. Yeah. I just couldn't wait to get out yep. because I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to go. It was, it was work. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a job for 29 years and it was the last year. So if I'm going to be true to that, then I'd have to say that I'd take less money to enjoy my job. Then. Mm-hmm make more money. I would say though that uh, that quarter of a million is is appealing. But that's why it's not a fair question. You know, it's kind of like you drop it down it, to 100,000 and 40,000 uh, now. Right. Well, but it is kind of like see cuz you know the way that I'm thinking about this is okay. If I did that job that I hate for like a few years, right, and save that money and invest it, then I could just quit altogether, not have a job anymore at all and live off those savings, right? But no, I mean, I, I think for those who know me and probably the listeners of this show, I, I wouldn't do what I'm doing on True Chat. I wouldn't, I, I would not be living where I'm living. I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing if uh, it was all about the money, because there are definitely easier ways to make a lot more money mm-hmm. than uh, what I'm doing right now. So, so true. That's for sure. Could definitely go do something else that <laughs> isn't nearly as hard. Um, but also probably wouldn't yield nearly as much satisfaction either. So there, there's your answer. And uh, our producer forgot to set up his microphone today. So uh, he he's unable to give us his answer. But mm. but you all need to let us know at TrueChat.org on social media, at TrueChat.org. So wrapping up our AME, uh, or AME, that's a TV network, isn't it? AME. AM, AMC is. AMC. A and D is a TV network. Um, so you got a lot of networks. They, 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 he's not, nah, I know. Uh, maybe it is. Is that the American Experience channel? I think there's an AME. Yeah, I'm pretty okay. sure there is. Look right. that up, producer. Find out. I think there's an AME channel. I mean, we came up with other ones, but I, right. think, I think there is an AME channel. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I was going for the UAE, the United uh, Arab uh, Emirates. Well, that's what I always thought the show was about, but I thought you That is what it. the show's about. Oh, no. Okay. I was just confusing my acronyms. Uh, so the, the last thing that we want to wrap up here with pointing this out is kind of talking about if this approach to the world is still effective for today. In other words, is this what we switch to with the Marshall Plan, this kind of thing, right? Rebuilding the world. Um, it worked for a long time and maybe it's still working, but that's the question, Lance. Is it still working? Is this really the approach that we should be taking? Or do we have to look at going back to, to one of two things? Either maybe being more isolationist or, or welcoming the opportunity or exploring opportunities to assert more formal control over territories. What do you think? Um, I only gave I, you a couple minutes to answer. No, but. I like, well, I don't need long because I, I like what we've done because I think it worked. I mean, for the most part, we were able to keep, you know, to keep our wars, our fights small and to keep them away from us. I mean, I think the attacks of 9-11 were so dramatic because it was on our home soil. You know, I mean, I remember not, it wasn't the same number, but, you know, the number of soldiers um, that were killed when they were attacked in the Middle East. Um I think it was 1981 or 83 um, when we were attacked with President Reagan. Um, but it's always been away from us, and we've been able to pretty much um, maintain control over the world and have a strong voice in what's going on around the world. Um, and I think that's better than the option that you gave, you know, and that, and that is getting so much involved that 
then we get stuck in places um, <clears throat> like Vietnam and like we have in Iraq and Afghanistan um, and Syria, you know, um, so far not Venezuela. Uh, we shall see. You know, but I think those are those are situations you can't win in. You know, at some point you're just gonna you're going to have to cut your losses. You know, in those, um, it is in those places. So I, I I like the idea of just governing from afar and trying to economic economically control regimes and control those people to make de- that are in power to make decisions that are beneficial to the United States and its citizens. I, I like that tact better than trying to nation build. I think that's a sticky wicket that we just don't normally do very well in. That nobody does. Right. That nobody does well in. So I think you need to, I don't think that's a good way to go about things. I'll, I'll leave it with this. I, I, I know you're not. I know that, you know, you're, you want everybody to fly the flag of the United States and all be a part of us and have 700 countries be under the U.S. flag and apply for statehood. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I continue to give this thought because I think part of understanding that approach is also understanding that I have, I think, a more, maybe not idealistic, more Puritan view of the ideology behind the United States of America. Um, again, we say that name and we don't think about what it means very often. But when I fly the American flag, flying below it is the flag of the state of Ohio because I identify and probably know more about the state than most people who live in Ohio do. I don't think that that's necessarily bad that they don't, but I also appreciate greatly the idea behind states' rights and what it meant to take relatively small territories – In most cases, I mean, with the exception of places like Alaska and Texas and California, these massive states that really are not nearly the same as a place like Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, um, some of the more average sized states uh, or are really tiny states like Rhode Island. I think part of the appeal and one of the reasons that we chose the form of government that we did is this idea of a balance between a united front but also the power of local self-governance and the benefits that come with that, understanding that what the people of Ohio need and what the people of Arizona need are not always the same, but they probably both need a strong military and they probably both need good access to health care. You know, those are things that they both need. Uh, But for example, most of Arizona doesn't have a really big concern with snow removal. You know, now there, there are some mountainous areas in Arizona that have a big concern with that, right? Mm -hmm. But most of the state isn't familiar with needing snow removal. That's not something they need. In Ohio, it's pretty much a consideration for most of the state, uh, a lot of the time. And that's just one tiny example of we have such a large country geographically that spans, you know, uh, coast to coast, which is, which again is very unusual. We border two major oceans. Um, And all of that lends itself to what I think we ought to look at ourselves as and be, which is a union, again, a word that's not used very often anymore, um, but a union of individual governments, which technically is what we are, Mm -hmm. that could very easily welcome and should welcome continuing to diversify that union by allowing others who wish to participate in it to join. But again, I preface all that by saying it requires a different, I don't think it's different. It requires a more originalistic, is that a word, (laughs) view of the United States that I think has kind of been lost to the way of history. Our pride as a nation, I think, has superseded our pride as individual states. And while I don't think that's all bad, I do think that a return to some of that self-governance uh, certainly wouldn't hurt things, you know, uh, when it's, again, properly regulated. It's always a battle and it's an experiment and it's a whole discussion that we've done before and I'm sure we'll do again. I just wanted to leave you guys with that to think about because it is something I keep thinking about ever since the last time we spoke about it and when we talk about topics like this. So what do you think about the United Arab Emirates and Prince Mohammed? Uh, is 
is the way that we're handling the situation right now the way to go about it? Uh, and I think it plays to this larger thing that Lance and I keep talking about. What should our foreign policy be? What should it look like? Because it ultimately has a big impact on us, whether or not we realize that it does. Let us know at TrueChatORG, Facebook, Twitter, and across all social media. Lance, we've challenged people to tune in. How should they do that? Oh, well, you've got Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and anywhere fine podcasts are found. Pretty easy, huh? I think so. That's right. Seems like it. And we've got some exciting stuff uh, lined up. We flagged a few things that we'll be talking about later this week and into next week. So be sure to stay up to date on that. For the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change.